everybody who is online and uh, catching another of our water issues seminars this morning. Um, one of the things that I was thinking would be really good to hear about is the recent developments and concerns and research that our good people in our wastewater treatment plants do in eliminating uh, waste from our waste stream before it gets into the river. And uh, Walter Adkins is going to tell us about some really interesting work that they have been doing and pursuing and identifying phosphorus, uh, high spikes of phosphorus that have been coming into the metro plant and identifying the source of that um, so that they can um, adequately remove that before it gets into the river. And uh, so Walter is going to tell us about that this morning and uh, comes to us on rather short notice. So Walter, thanks a lot for uh, being game to do this presentation for us this morning. We're really looking forward to your talk. All right, thank you very much for the introduction, Mark. Um, I'm gonna take my video off so it's a little bit nicer for everyone connection-wise. All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is Walter Atkins and I'm in the R&D department of the Metro Wastewater Treatment Plant. And today I'm going to tell you about a special type of phosphorus that's in the wastewater that you might not know about. Now it's called SNRP or soluble non-reactive phosphorus and electrolyzed nickel plating is a major source of it for some metropolitan utilities. So let's start with an overview. We observed discrete highly concentrated spikes of soluble non-reactive phosphorus at the metropolitan wastewater treatment plant. SNRP removal at Metro is poor with nearly 40% of the SNRP passing through untreated. We strategically sampled the interceptors starting from Metro and located a significant discharge. And finally, we developed potential oxidation pretreatment processes where, if implemented, they're capable of reducing the Metro effluent TP loading by 20 to 25%. Now, for some general background, Metro is owned and operated by Metropolitan Council of Environmental Services. It's located in St. Paul, Minnesota. Metro treats 190 million gallons of wastewater per day, which is then discharged to the Mississippi River. It's classified as a secondary treatment system utilizing activated sludge with enhanced biological phosphorus removal and nitrification. MCES runs nine treatment plants in the region, treating 250 million gallons of wastewater per day and serving more than 2 million residents. Now Metro is by far the biggest plant and treats over two thirds of the overall system's wastewater. Now before we get into details, uh, let's have, start with some quick clarification on what we'll be talking about. This chart shows the speciation for phosphorus, where soluble here refers to a sample that has been passed through a 0.45 micron filter. Now, simple benchtop tests, they may be performed for both soluble total P and orthophosphate, and operationally, SNRP is defined as the difference between soluble total phosphorus and orthophosphate, so it is quite easy to measure. It all started with these spikes that we observed. Now this graph shows the concentration of SNRP over a year beginning in 2015. Now, as is evident, there are weekly to bi-weekly spikes in the influent that are about 700% of the baseline SNRP. Now this is the influent, but what is concerning here is when we look at the effluent as well. The same spikes appear in the effluent indicating that there's poor removal and that a lot of the SNRP is making it through the plant untreated we decided that we needed to find the source. So we did some investigative sampling to track the SNRP back to the source. Now, starting at Metro, we would follow the interceptor sewers upstream until we reached the fork. Now at this fork, we would sample the sewer in each direction. After that, sample sites were then strategically chosen in order to eliminate branches in the MCES interceptor sewers. Sites that displayed marginal amounts of SNRP while the spike was observed downstream were abandoned. In this fashion, we continued until the source was reached. Now, this is what some of the actual data looks like. Hourly composite sampling was performed at each site. This graph shows the concentration of SNRP over a day, and the image on the right displays the interceptor map with Metro located on the bottom right. 
Now, as you move upstream toward the source of the SNRP spikes, the wastewater should become more concentrated in SNRP, and that's exactly what we saw. Now, starting with uh, TB3 in the gray, we see that as we move upstream through MH85 and to MH42 in the green and the blue, the spikes are significantly more concentrated, indicating that we're getting closer to the source. And additionally, the distinct shape of the spikes is maintained, suggesting that they're emanating from the same source. Now, this is an aerial map over the St. Paul area. Uh, the investigative sampling, it led us from the metro plant on the bottom right here in St. Paul to Roseville, Minnesota, to Evoca Water Technologies. They're a central treatment recovery facility and one of our industrial dischargers. Now, they provide an essential service to the metropolitan area, uh, serving as a collection and treatment hub for numerous industries before sending us much of the resulting waste. They helped identify the SNRP compound as phosphate, a reduced form of phosphorus with a plus three valence. The records indicate that they're sending us about 45 metric tons of SNRP annually, and with Metro's poor removal of SNRP, that means about 20 tons of SNRP are passing through the plant and into the river untreated. So, where's this wastewater coming from? Where does it originate? It starts with uh, electroless nickel plating. When they're finished with the spent plating bath that is sent to Evoqua, where they recover the leftover nickel. Evoqua then discharges it into the interceptors where we receive it at Metro. So let's now discuss why this wastewater is being generated. The process is the deposition of a nickel alloy coating by means of a chemical reduction. So thus, unlike electroplating, there is no current required to form the deposit. Now, electroless nickel plating is a common, prevalent plating process, and it's been growing in recent decades. So, most metropolitan utilities should be receiving some sort of waste from them. The simplified governing equation is shown here. So you have your nickel source on the left, and then next to that is phosphate hypophosphate, which is the reducing agent. What this does is it supplies the electrons necessary to reduce the nickel into a solid nickel coating. Now, a large amount of hypophosphate is required for the process, and by the end of it, a large amount of phosphate has been generated. That's the main content of the spent bath, which ultimately ends up at the treatment plant. Electroless nickel plating is a unique process. It produces a uniform thickness over the most complicated shapes, in addition to providing a number of specialty characteristics that plain electroplating cannot provide. So it is significantly more expensive because of this, and thus it is not a substitute for electroplating, but it's used when these unique deposit characteristics are required. So the spent bath, it has 100 grams per liter of phosphate, which to put into perspective, that's about 500,000 times more concentrated than the average influent wastewater that we receive at Metro. This is an enormous amount of phosphorus and treating it is going to result, or it's going to require an enormous amount of reagent. In addition to that, it has lots of ammonia, COD, buffers, chelators. The resulting matrix means that targeting the destruction of phosphite is a difficult, complex process, as we'll see later. The electroless nickel wastewater has a significant system-wide impact. The numbers on these donut charts are annual discharges and metric tons of phosphorus from various MCES plants with SNRP on the left, TP on the right, and the respective totals in the middles of the donuts. Here, I have highlighted the electroless nickel wastewater contribution shown in black. So system-wide, where we treat 250 million gallons per day of wastewater, this one single discharge is 40% of our effluent SNRP and 15% of our total phosphorus system-wide. It's an enormous load. Having it concentrated within a single discharger means that a single pretreatment option could eliminate the vocal's contribution and significantly reduce our effluent phosphorus loadings. So in total phosphorus, for instance, we would be going from 127 to 108 tons per year. That's a 15% system-wide MCES reduction in total phosphorus in a single wastewater stream. 
Now, looking at the chart on the right, it shows us the enormity of the situation. The Evoco slice is about the same size as our Seneca and Blue Lake wastewater treatment plants. That means that the amount of phosphorus discharged in this single electroless nickel wastewater stream is comparable to that to our second and largest, our second and third largest treatment plants. So let's discuss the theory behind how we planned on doing this. These are different species of phosphorus, and the number displayed is the valence of the phosphorus atom. So here, on the left, the plater started with hypophosphite, the reducing agent, that was used to plate the nickel. The plating process oxidized it to phosphite in the middle, and that is the content of the spent fat. Our goal with pretreatment here is then to oxidize it further to the end product, phosphate. Phosphate is easily removed at Metro in our enhanced biological phosphorus removal, where we typically see about 96% removal. And thus, oxidizing the phosphate is synonymous with a reduction in effluent total phosphorus loadings. The pretreatment processes that we developed include oxidation using permanganate and bleach. So let's get into some details. We're going to start with permanganate. This graph shows SNRP removal versus the molar ratio of permanganate to phosphorus. We've tested permanganate on the as-is electroless nickel wastewater, shown in orange, and with an artificial aqueous solution of pure phosphate, shown in blue. Now, if you recall, the matrix of the electroless nickel wastewater is heavy. What I mean by that is, in addition to being highly concentrated in phosphate, there's also all of that COD, ammonia, chelators, complexing agents, and as we can see in the graph, the treatment of the plain phosphate solution in the blue is significantly more effective as complete removal is achieved at a molar ratio of just about 0.5. However, in treating the electroless nickel wastewater, we see that the matrix effect hinders the oxidative effect of permanganate, and it takes substantially more reagent to achieve good removal. Nevertheless, permanganate was a successful oxidant. Next, we wanted to test the effects of the pH. This graph shows SNRP removal versus pH with the initial pH in blue and the final pH in orange. Permanganate oxidation does not appear to be dependent on pH, though it is a little less effective at very low pH. However, what is important here is that we can achieve a treated wastewater with a final neutral pH. If we were to implement this pretreatment at Evoqua, they'd be sending the treated waste down the sewers. So having a neutral product allows that for a potential option. This is a very fast process. The left axis shows SNRP removal and temperature in blue and orange respectively. And the right axis shows pH and gray versus time. All variables display the same general shape before flatlining. This data suggests that the reaction is complete within about 30 seconds. Implementing the pretreatment would be quite simple. It could be done at Evoco. After recovering the nickel, Evoco could simply mix in permanganate with the specified molar ratio before discharging it into the interceptor sewers, where we would then receive it at Metro as phosphate, which is easily removed in our activated sludge system. We calculated that the increased influent loading of manganese at Metro and that in the resulting ash would be marginal. Next, let's talk about bleach. We wanted to test the SNRP removal capacity based on the chlorine speciation. Now this chlorine speciation graph shown here, it says that at a pH of 6.5, the active species of bleach is HOCl or hypochlorous acid, whereas at a pH of 8.5, the active species is OCl or hypochlorite. We ran a series of experiments under both of these conditions. Now, overall, bleach was a successful oxidant for both chlorine species. This graph shows SNRP removal versus the molar ratio for HOCl shown in orange and OCl shown in blue. Now, both are capable of achieving nearly 100% of the SNRP removal at a molar ratio of about 2.7. 
However, at lower levels, near the left side of the graph, we can see that HOCl is a better candidate as it's about nearly twice as effective at a molar ratio of 1.75. Implementing this pretreatment would also be simple, and after recovering the nickel, Evoco could mix in bleach at the specified molar ratio before discharging it into the interceptors. This process does, however, generate some gaseous odors, which may require air quality control equipment to be employed. Now, both pretreatments, they yield near complete oxidation of the SNRP in the electrolyzed nickel wastewater to orthophosphate, which can be readily removed by the activated sludge process at Metro. This pretreatment process, if implemented, it would translate to up to a 25% reduction of total phosphorus in the Metro effluent. That's a 15% reduction in the MCEF system wide, including our nine treatment plants. Again, phosphorus reduction that would result from treating a single discharge stream is comparable to taking either our second or third largest 30 million gallon per day wastewater treatment plants offline. That's huge. So why aren't we doing it? Let's talk about our current situation. It currently comes down to regulations and cost. Now presently, we're at no risk of violating our permit and effluent total phosphorus loads. Additionally, there's substantial cost associated with implementing either pretreatment process. So, well, right now, there's no real economic justification for it. We here at Metro, and potentially other metropolitan utilities with electroless nickel wastewaters, we have these pretreatment processes as a tool for overall effluent total phosphorus reduction for when there are no other viable options. Now, on a broader scale, this project demonstrates another benefit of the central treatment recovery facilities like Evoqua and their potential to serve as regional collection and pretreatment hubs for SNRP in areas that have substantial electrolysis nickel plating industry. Now we did some digging and uh, we only came up with some outdated statistics from 93 to 2003, but we used that data to estimate that over 9,000 metric tons of phosphate as P are generated annually at electrolysis nickel plating facilities. However, electrolysis nickel plating it has grown substantially in the past few decades, while sodium hypophosphite remains the primary reducing agent being used. Thus, this number um, it probably underestimates the current annual phosphite loading from electrolysis nickel plating facilities overall. So, considering the poor removal of SNRP despite good overall TP removal displayed in our treatment plants, the potential role of central treatment and recovery facilities to serve as pretreatment hubs for SNRP, it could provide significant reductions in point source phosphorus entering ambient water. So I hope that you're all, uh, all now well acquainted with the process of electrolysis nickel plating, uh, its prevalence, the wastewater generated, and what it looks like on the receiving end for a major metropolitan wastewater treatment plant. Additionally, if a large amount of wastewater is concentrated within a single discharger, as is the case with Metro and Evoqua, you should not be aware that potential pre-treatment options, they may exist where, if implemented, they have the potential to reduce effluent phosphorus loading significantly. And uh, some quick acknowledgements. Uh, thank you to uh, Steve here, who's been a partner in this whole project and kind of leading it. I'm just following directions. Uh, the rest of the R&D uh, team, uh, previous interns that worked on SNRP, uh, everyone in industrial waste, they helped out with uh, all of the auto sampling and then um, talked to us about permitting and everything when we were coming up with pre-treatment options. And then uh, finally, everyone at Evoqua, who's uh, been open to share all of their information with us and uh, discuss pre-treatment opportunities. So uh, that's all I got. Uh, thank you very much for all of your time. Yeah, Walter, that was a great presentation, very nice, you know, succinct presentation of what you have been able to accomplish over the last uh, few years of investigation. That's great. You know, one question I have is, um, do you know if there are any plans down the road to implement this in a, you know, full scale kind of thing to eliminate that enormous amount of phosphorus from the waste stream? Um, well, as I discussed with uh, the current situation, um, there's no real need to do it. 
Uh, I guess I can't speak for the future. I mean, if we got hit with a very strict permit, I mean, that option's out there, but unless something like that comes up, uh, I don't foresee us doing anything at Metro. So, Brooke, do we have any questions uh, submitted online from viewers? I don't see any yet. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can um, certainly unmute um, or if you want to just um, type a question into the chat. Um, we have a question about will the slides be made available? Um, yes, we are recording this session. And so once um, that is saved through WebEx, then we post it to the Water Issues YouTube site. And I will actually post that link right into the chat here. So has that. So I think you said, Walter, that this practice of electroless nickel plating seems to be growing in use and popularity nationwide. It seems like this research on how to remove phosphite from the waste stream is just going to find broader and more important application going forward as that becomes um, a, a procedure of an industrial procedure of choice for for platers. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's there's plenty of uh, research papers on the subject. Um, people have found out all different kinds of ways to uh, capture all of the phosphorus. I mean, it is a limited substance, and right now we're doing okay. But in the future, we're definitely probably going to be looking at these electroless nickel platers as a huge source for it. Uh, some people use you know, palladium and activated carbon, um, other absorption things. There's a, a fenton reagent, which is another oxidation thing that could be followed by, um, you know, another adsorption reaction. So in the future, people are probably going to be trying to recover this. Or, uh, you know, they might change the, um, the reducing agent and not use all of the hypophosphate for that. We do have a couple of questions. Um, one is how many samples were taken when you were trying to find the source and how long did this take? Okay, um, let's see, is, is Steve here? Are you out in the audience at all? I am here. <laughs> okay, so um, I wasn't here for that exact time. I worked with some of the data, but I think you could uh, explain that more succinctly. Yeah, I, it took us about mm, maybe a month, really. It was June of 2015, and we had an intern, and her name was Elizabeth Dranch. She was a chemical engineer from the university, a really sharp young lady, and um, she probably analyzed, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred samples um, of wastewater that we that we um, collected at that time. And like I said, it took us about a month, um, you know, and each week we would, um, or every few days, we would have to move our samplers and go up the next line of the sewers and the interceptors and see what, what, you know, what was coming down that one. So, but within a month, we were walking in the front door of Evoqua and saying, are you guys doing this? And they said, yep, we're doing this. So. Great, we have another, we have several uh, questions, so I'll go through them as we kind of uh, wrap up each one. Um, how long did it take Metro to trace back the source to Evoca? Um, so yeah, as Steve said, I think it, yeah, it took about a month. Okay, that was the kind of two, you answered both questions before you even knew you had it. <clears throat> uh, another question um, is, there any worry about adding chloride as part of bleach to the system with the high emphasis on salt in the environment right now it may be concerning to trade one pollutant for another very good question yeah uh that is true um i guess we haven't done an actual uh load analysis of this um i don't know if steve would think that our addition of that would be negligible or not or I don't really know how the uh, hypochlorite would act once in the wastewater system. I don't know if it would come out as chloride. Uh, 
Do you have any thoughts, Steve? Yeah, you know, I we haven't really looked at that. It's a really, really good question, um, but we haven't we haven't examined what happens to, you know, bleach that we would put in in that way, um, and what would happen to the chlorine chloride. So yeah, very good question, but yeah, haven't looked at it. Sorry. That's great. Is that something that <clears throat> you would be able to look at in the in the future? Um, we just are in the process right now. In case you guys aren't aware, um, we are unveiling our statewide chloride management plan, where we're really kind of pushing hard to reduce chloride as much as possible. And um, you know, Metro wastewater treatment plant um, is a significant um, load, you know, of chloride. Uh, we know Mississippi River is a large volume, but you guys have some fantastic. Um, chloride data on all of our large river sources in the metro area and the increase in chloride over the last 30 years has been quite um, staggering in certain areas, um, particularly um, along the St. Croix, but also along the Mississippi as well. And so that's something that uh, our agency is working really hard at how do we reduce chloride since we're seeing increasing trends and we already have 50 um, surface waters across the state that have that are above that 230 milligram per liter standard and uh, I just happen to be the chloride coordinator so this is a uh, uh, for the agency so this is a topic that is very near and dear to me so I think it would be really um, important to understand how much chloride loading um, would increase because of you know this change because that's a really good point that we certainly don't want to be trading um, one pollutant for another, and that's something that in the winter maintenance side we're looking at. MnDOT is looking to switch to potentially potassium acetate, but before they do that, they're doing a research project to better understand what are the environmental impacts of potassium acetate on the environment and the macroinvertebrates and um, the other aquatic life in the area. So it'd be really interesting to have that kind of coupled with your research so that we understand that um, completely. All right, I will stop talking about Chloride. Um, what else do we have in here? I mean, there's a lot of comments coming up, so I'll try to see if I missed any. <clears throat> what is the fate of phosphite in the environment? Does it get oxidized to phosphate eventually? Yeah, that was my question too. I think it's a good question. Uh, yes, actually, so um, phosphite, it can be directly metabolized by microorganisms. Um, reduced P compounds in aquatic systems, uh, they can eventually be either utilized or oxidized into orthophosphate, although the literature suggests that the reaction rates are quite slow. Um, so then of course, you know, once it ends up as orthophosphate, then we have to worry about, you know, eutrophication, excessive alkyl pollutants, and so on and so forth. So it, it does add into, you know, um, I don't know, we're just kind of looking at it as the same thing, like, once it's in the environment, it's going to either get used by someone or it's going to get converted into orthophosphate. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, did the effluent SNRP graph show some loss of phosphate? What mechanism process um, causes this reduction? Okay, so, um, yep, absolutely. Um, let's see. So overall, we saw about 40% removal. So um, I don't know if you remember the graph and the peaks. I don't know if I can get all the way back there. So, yeah, we saw about a 40% reduction. Um, we're not quite sure about the mechanism and process that uh, has caused this. Um, we tried doing some testing. We ran... Um, you know, some little tiny bent scale tests to try to replicate the activated sludge process. Um, we tried looking at whether it was anaerobically removed or aerobically removed. Uh, I was not very successful. Um, I replicated, you know, basically what we're doing at Metro um, using the same residence times, um, you know, the, the RAS reaeration um, ratios and all of that. I could not achieve any SNRP reduction. Um, the best thing that I could achieve was that over the course of a week, I, I kept it aerated and every day I fed, I fed my bath a little bit of extra influence just to keep the, the bugs working. I was able to see a 30% reduction. 
Um, so somehow Metro is re removing 60% of it. Uh, we're not quite sure where in the plant that's happening. Um, it's a soluble non-reactive thing. So we're like, hey, you know, it's probably not coming out in primary, um, but we haven't tested this specifically. And that's something where more research is needed. There's not much out there as far as research paper goes either. Um, I think I found one single article that talked about um, SNRP removal in a plant. Uh, I think they found that overall about 80% got removed. I think it was an advanced secondary system. Uh, they found that 55% of it got removed in the anaerobic stage. And then um, it also went through membranes and things like that. So uh, no one really knows right now. And that's probably going to become a big area of research if more people look into this. Great, thank you. Um, and that's all I see in the chat for questions for you. Uh, so unless anybody else had any last questions they wanted to ask Walter or Steve. <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work with us. And um, we uh, maybe we'll hear back from you in a while when you've got some new information and data to share with us. It'd be great if you want to keep us in the loop on any interesting studies or research you're doing. Um, we are always looking for um, good presenters for our water issues talks. And um, I think we would find your um, information valuable to share with us. So thanks again for being here. And um, we will um, see everybody in two weeks. And I'm just checking out the schedule. Mark, do you remember who we got up next? I don't right offhand. I did not look. So it'd be a surprise. It looks like we've got, oh, we've got Amy, uh, Amy Bacham from the Riley Purgatory Bluff Watershed District. Um, she is their current Green Corps member. So we're going to be starting um, hearing from some oh, of the Green Corps members starting, uh, it's July, is it already that late? My goodness. Uh, July 23rd. Wow. July is just flying by. <clears throat> So um, thanks again, uh, Walter and Steve, for being here today. And uh, we'll see the rest of you on uh, the 23rd. Have a great week, everybody. Hey, Wal Walter, thanks very much for the presentation. Nice job. Hey, thanks a lot. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.